So we'll talk about the different stroke subtypes. Um, we'll talk about different symptoms that you might find on the left or the right side. And, uh, and one of the big things that we want to get across here is that every stroke is different. It's very fascinating uh, as, we, uh, as we assess patients and some of the deficits that they have when we look at their imaging. Uh, we would, sometimes we expect many more deficits or worse deficits than what their imaging is showing. And in someone else with very similar uh, stroke, uh, may have more deficits than the other person. So uh, it's very interesting to see how every patient is, is just very different than how they present. So we always like to start off these uh, lectures with just, just a recap on, on what a stroke is. I'm sure everybody in this room is intimately familiar with uh, the effects of stroke, uh, but I would like to talk about uh, what a stroke is. There are two types of stroke. There's a stroke where a blood vessel in the brain gets blocked and get blocked by a blood clot or a piece of plaque. And what that clot happens, it's, it's, it's just like plumbing. When there gets to be a, a blockage in your plumbing, what happens? Well, uh, the water is not gonna uh, uh, empty out downstream. Same thing with a stroke. Once that blood vessel gets blocked, that blood is not getting to the tissues on the other side of that blockage and the tissue starts dying after only a few minutes. And that's when you have your, what we call ischemic stroke. And then you have uh, your hemorrhagic strokes. These are different strokes in the fact that uh, you have a, a breakage in a blood vessel and the blood will spill out into the brain or uh, surrounding the brain. Uh, so that's more of a bleeding stroke. So the vast majority of strokes uh, that occur out there are the blockage type, the ischemic strokes. Uh, and usually uh, that's about 80% of the strokes that are out there. Uh, usually 15 to 20% of the other strokes are the bleeding types. Uh, another thing that we like to touch on is what we call a transient ischemic attack or a TIA or a lot of people will refer to them as mini strokes. Uh, we hear that a lot. But there's a, there's a, there's a very uh, big difference between a true stroke and a TIA. So the TIA is just a temporary blockage in the blood vessel. You will experience symptoms, but those symptoms are often short-lived and you completely recover and get all the function back within, usually within the hour. Uh, there's no, uh, if we were to get an MRI after a TIA, we would not see any evidence of stroke. Uh, that is a big difference between TIA and stroke, is that there is no death of the brain tissue. So the big thing that you want to remember with a TIA is that it is a warning sign. If you have transient symptoms like this, you need to get to a hospital very quickly and get checked out. Uh, those individuals that have TIA have a much greater chance of then moving on to have a stroke within the next 30 days. And so uh, even though your symptoms have resolved, you're at a very high risk of having a full-blown stroke. And so it's very important that you are seen uh, by a neurologist uh, so that they can evaluate and try to find out why you had that TIA. One of the most important things we do at the hospital is figure out why you had this stroke so that we can take steps to prevent any further strokes. Um, so like I said with the TIA, we're not going to see any evidence of it on, on our imaging. It's very temporary. There's no brain death. Um, it, uh, you resolve completely from that. Um, there are some things that we look at in the hospital to try to figure out uh, how, how much your, your risk is for having a, a stroke uh, imminently. Um, those are some of the things that we'll look at in the emergency department. Based on those findings, we'll make a decision on whether or not you need to be admitted to the hospital or if it's something we can do uh, uh, follow up with you outpatient uh, within the next few days. 
So the ischemic strokes, uh, there are different types of ischemic strokes. And, and really, when we look at that area, we're, we're trying to figure out what's the cause of the stroke. The different types of stroke indicate more or less what causes the stroke. So the first, time, uh, first one is a small vessel stroke. Then we have large vessel strokes. We have uh, cardioembolic strokes or uh, clots that come from the heart. Uh, we have what we call cryptogenic, which is a fancy word for saying, I'm, I don't know where the stroke came from or what the cause was. And then you have uh, other determined types of strokes, which can be from a tear in the blood vessel. It can be from a clotting disorder where your, your blood clots very easily. Um, so there are different, uh, different aspects uh, that we look at when someone has a stroke to figure out why they had the stroke in the first place. And a lot of, depending on the type of stroke, tells us, uh, gives us a very good idea of what or why you had the stroke and how we can work with you uh, to prevent you from having any further strokes. So the first one we'll cover is the most common type of stroke. It's just what we call small vessel uh, stroke or small vessel occlusions. Um, you might also hear it as a lacuna stroke, which is a, like a French word for like a small pond. Um, but it's a very, they're very tiny strokes. It typically happen in the tiniest of blood vessels in the deep structures of your brain. Um, and they're the most common. Um, large vessel ischemic strokes, these are, these are going to be, so the small vessel strokes are just like what they say. They uh, are very tiny strokes and tiniest blood vessels. Um, usually that's because of high blood pressure, um, uncontrolled uh, cholesterol, uncontrolled diabetes, um, smoking, uh, very common with those. Uh, and then we have our large vessel ischemic strokes. Uh, and this is going to be an occlusion of a large artery. Uh, so you have uh, carotid arteries in your neck. Um, you have larger blood vessels uh, deep in your brain uh, that, uh, that the carotid arteries will fill. They go into the larger arteries in your brain. And then from there, uh, they branch out all the way up to the cortex, to so the very outside of your brain. And so you have... <clears throat> several different arteries that we really specifically look at, the right middle cerebral and left middle cerebral arteries. Uh, we have the internal parotid arteries, which we talked about, and anterior cerebral arteries. All those arteries um, encircle your brain and branch out uh, to provide uh, oxygenation to all those structures. Um, in the back uh, of your brain, in the back of your neck, you have uh, two vertebral arteries that go up the inside of your neck. Those arteries come up and meet together, and then they go up the front of your brain stem to form the basilar arteries. The basilar artery is one of the most dangerous arteries to have a stroke in. Because um, that is, again, that's feeding your brain stem. So a lot of very um, important uh, Aspects for living, for living uh, come from your brain stem, the ability for your heart to pump, your breathing. Um, and, then all, and then it's also an area where all those telephone fibers, I describe as telephone fibers, they all spin down all the way, get very tightly compacted and go through your brain stem into your spinal cord. So even a tiny stroke in the brain stem can have devastating effects. Uh, so the basal artery is very This is just a picture to show you the dis. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, is it bad for us to know what kind of stroke we have, or do we just leave that up to doctors? When you have a stroke, it's it's a good idea to know. Uh, I would ask questions uh, of your doctors and why, where was the stroke at? They should show you the imaging. Okay, if they don't ask them. It helps you to visualize what is going on in your brain. Um, I'm a very visual person. 
Uh, before I see my patients, one of the first things I do is I look at their imaging because uh, I, I'm, I, I like that visualization. I want to know, I want to get to know that patient, um, not just as a person, but I also want to get to know their brain and, and where those deficits are. It helps me uh, form a picture of, of, of what, uh, what I'm going to see when I assess them. Um, so it's a good idea for you to know uh, where your stroke was and why that stroke occurred. Okay. Now, in about 20% of people, we're never going to know exactly why you had that stroke. So uh, if you have a stroke and you do all this workup and they come back and they say, we're not exactly sure why you had this stroke. Don't worry, one out of five people, we can never know. Uh, but there's a lot of them that we do figure out why they have the stroke, uh, which is more helpful, like I said, because then we can work with you on preventing the next stroke. Um, so, so that's why it, it gets important to know why you had that stroke. And again, with the blood vessels in your head, um, that can tell us, give us reasons as to maybe why you had that stroke in the first place. Like I said, the small vessel occlusions. That can give us ideas on what it most likely was. So it's good to know. So your right middle cerebral artery, um, if you have a blockage in the right middle cerebral artery, that is a large vessel, what we call a large vessel occlusion. Your middle cerebral arteries, um, they allow blood to get to the largest area of your brain. So if one of those middle cerebral arteries with your whether it's the right or the left, it's blocked, um, and you are going to have very significant deficits. And some of the deficits you can expect to have, especially if you block the right middle cerebral artery, is uh, your, your gaze when we're normal. Our gaze is, is in a primary position. I look at straight ahead at rest. And someone who's had a large right MCA territory stroke their gaze is actually going to, they're going to be looking to the right. Okay. So that has to do with some of the, uh, the, the way we use our eye muscles uh, get affected by these types of strokes. You will have left side weakness. Remember, in the upper brain structures, if you have a stroke on one side, it's going to affect the muscles on the opposite side. So a right MCA stroke, you're going to have left side weakness. You may have left side numbness. You may also lose some of the vision in the left, uh, in your left visual field. So you may not be able to see things on the left side. And part of that is because as your, uh, your optic nerve goes into your brain, uh, those projections then fan out through the middle cerebral area, area territories to the back of your brain where that vision is processed. Uh, and then you may also have what we call neglect, where you, you don't, uh, you're not, uh, you're favoring one side. So if you have um, a left side neglect, then you're not paying attention, like you don't recognize the left side of your body. It's a very strange phenomenon, but it can be very common in large uh, right hemisphere strokes. The left middle cerebral artery territory, this is where things, um, get much more difficult for the patient if you have the left middle cerebral artery strokes. Okay, so just like the right MCA, you're gonna you're gonna have uh, your gaze preference is gonna go to the left side, so it'll go to the opposite side of the left. You'll have right side weakness, right side numbness. You may have the right visual field cut, but most importantly and most devastatingly is your speech centers on about 85 to 90% of people is on the left side of your brain. So the left middle cerebral artery is providing blood to your speech centers. So if you have a large stroke on that side, uh, you may lose the ability to speak or have difficulty with speaking. Um, you may lose the ability to understand speech, uh, written or verbal. Um, and you may have difficulty <clears throat> getting the right words out. So it can be very difficult and frustrating for people. 
um, to have those left MCA strokes because it affects your ability to communicate. So. So we have uh, uh, some of the another large blood vessel is your uh, internal carotid arteries. These are two arteries that come up the inside of the, the front part of your neck and into your brain. And usually, it's going to look like an uh, like a, a middle cerebral artery uh, stroke, uh, just because once you blood clot, I'm sorry, once you block blood from going up, say the right carotid artery, it's therefore going to block blood going to the right middle cerebral artery. Now you have some redundancy there because uh, you have what we call the cervical bullets, where if one side gets blocked, sometimes it can kind of come around to the other side. But, but in those very uh, sudden instances, um, your body's probably not going to be able to compensate quite enough, so you will have those large strokes of um, and in, again, you also have, uh, it'll affect the anterior cerebral arteries on these types of strokes too. The anterior cerebral arteries come up and over your head like this and affect, uh, they supply uh, the brain, uh, blood to the brain that controls your legs. So you can have really significant weakness of your leg in the, in the carotid artery infusions. And again, and then we talk about anterior cerebral artery. Um, these are some uh, MRI pictures of the territory. You can see it's just a strip that goes right up over the top of your brain. Um, and and we'll keep the parts well, but you can see where that stroke is. So this is a left anterior cerebral artery stroke. And it'll affect the opposite leg. So this person is going to have right leg. Uh, it's, it's a little more uncommon uh, to see those anterior cerebral artery occlusions. And again, like you oftentimes can see them uh, as tandem occlusions with the uh, internal carotid artery. Back to the, uh, so that everything, all those blood vessels we covered, <clears throat> that's what we call anterior circulation. It's all kind of the front part of the brain. Now, these next few blood vessels are the ones that supply the back part of your brain. So we call that the posterior circulation. And that's composed of, you have uh, two vertebral arteries, like I talked about earlier, that go up the back part of your neck. And as they go into the skull, they will come together. And here's, here you can see these are the vertebral arteries, the big ones here, and they come together and form the basilar artery. And the basilar artery goes up, and then at the very top of the basilar, it branches off into your posterior cerebral arteries. Okay? That's a little bit of the anatomy as far as your blood vessels go. Uh, but this, like I said, this is where your brain is going to be. So you can have very unusual symptoms with these. Um, you can have numbness of the body. Uh, you can have numbness on one side of the face and, and numbness on the other side of the body. Uh, you can start with what we call cross symptoms. Uh, you can have difficulty with your coordination. The posterior circulation also supplies blood to your cerebellum which is the very back bottom part of your brain, which the cerebellum works with uh, coordination, balance, things of that nature. Um, so you can have uh, this, what we call the stagnus, which is where your eyes um, aren't working quite right. And you can have weakness of, of the eye muscles. You can have nausea. Uh, vertigo or dizziness. Um, you can have difficulty with swallowing your voice. People who have the um, brain stem strokes, typically their voice uh, it, it, it changes in pitch. And what I describe it as, it usually sounds like someone with a really bad sore throat. Uh, they just kind of lose some of that strength in their, in their voice. <clears throat> you can have hiccups. And uh, again, vision changes. 
Here we have a little bit of our left, uh, left brain, right brain. <clears throat> so, these are some of the things that can affect uh, that can, some, some of those kind of side uh, bar things that strokes can affect. Your left brain, you have your logic, analysis, mathematics, language, um, the thinking of uh, words, things of that nature, computation. The right brain is more of your creativity, it's more of your personality. Um, intuition, feelings, things of the dreaming, things of that nature. So there's just your left and right hemisphere. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why we have strokes. Um, as we, we finish with the anatomy, now we'll get back to that. So we can talk about cardioembolic strokes. These are clots that come from the heart. Uh, if you have a irregular rhythm, uh, one of the most common ones is atrial fibrillation. Um, what happens is the, uh, the atria of the heart, uh, okay, the compartments on the top of the brain, uh, they are not, there's an electrical problem with it. They're not pumping regularly. Instead of pumping regularly, they're almost quivering, okay? And when they quiver like that, uh, they're not pumping efficiently. And when they don't pump efficiently, blood tends to pool. And when blood pools, it clots, okay? When the, uh, and sometimes what'll happen is that clot can migrate down into the lower chamber and then push out into your carotid arteries and then your brain. Um, so, very good question. So one of the things is, uh, uh, is quick identification of atrial fibrillation. The problem is, is sometimes you don't know. Now, one of the most common signs is your, your pulse rate becomes uh, irregular. It's very irregular for a long period of time. Um, you may notice uh, decreased um, energy. You just don't have the up and go like, and not, um, uh, not the slow decrease in energy that you have with aging. This would be something very acute as your heart um, switches over into an atrial fibrillation type of, of uh, rhythm. And so being able to identify that quickly helps prevent stroke. Uh, the Apple Watches, I know uh, they have, they do have, some of them have the heart monitoring on them and they, they can let you know when your heart is in a regular rhythm. Um, it's certainly not diagnostic, but it can alert you, uh, and you can call your uh, doctor in those cases and get an appointment to get your heart checked out. So. Um, and then we have our other stroke subtypes, um, cerebral venous thrombosis. This is a, this is a little bit different. So when you think of, uh, when you think of the ischemic stroke, you think of a blood vessel getting, uh, an artery getting blocked off like your plumbing. And then everything um, after that doesn't get blood or oxygen. The, if you have a clot in your venous system in the brain, what happens is the opposite. Now it's getting backed up. So that blood is, is perfusing very well through your brain tissues. But then when it gets to the venous, system, there's a big clot, it doesn't let the blood, uh, uh, the venous blood flow out, and then you get a backup type situation. Uh, it can cause headaches, um, it can happen oftentimes if you get very dehydrated, um, and uh, it can actually cause blood uh, in your brain uh, as it backs up. So, uh, and typically with those, it, it's that's one of the very odd ones. Typically, if you have bleeding in your head, you don't want to thin the blood at all. But in the venous clots, you do want to thin the blood. Uh, you have spinal cord strokes. You can certainly have um, uh, strokes in the, in, the, in the cord itself. They're very rare. I can probably count on one hand how many of those I've seen in the last 10 years. Um, uh, but uh, it, can cause uh, weakness, can have pain with those. Um, oftentimes, the, the spinal strokes that I've seen typically occur after 
uh, some sort of um, intrathoracic surgery or abdominal surgery, um, typically dealing with the, uh, the aorta. So with these strokes, uh, when you, the big thing with this, and, and you're probably very well aware of it, but time is brain. So when these symptoms occur, or if you wake up with these symptoms, you gotta have to call 911 right away. Uh, the problem we get into is a lot of people go, uh, I'll just kind of wait and see how it goes. Um, and, and you know, maybe it'll go away. Uh, and a lot of times it doesn't. Uh, and then they're outside of the window for us to do anything. We can give clot busting drugs to certain people if, 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 uh, if the stars are aligned right and they're not on blood thinners. The clot busting drugs, uh, you need to be seen typically within four and a half hours of the symptoms starting. Uh, in some cases, uh, if, it, if you wake up with the symptoms, we can do some additional imaging to see if you're eligible for, for the clot busting drugs. Uh, and then in the large, if it's a large vessel occlusion, like your carotid or the middle cerebral arteries, we can do what we call thrombectomies, where an interventional radiologist will go in through the groin, just like if you're going to have a heart cath, but he bypasses the heart, goes up the carotid arteries into the brain, and they can actually pull the clot out. The problem with those is that uh, it has to be the larger vessels of the brain. It has to be within a certain time period. Uh, if, if you start having, um, uh, if, the, if the stroke is complete or near complete, then it doesn't make sense to pull the clot out. So uh, again, it's all very um, dedicated on time. Time and brain. Um, again, when someone comes in the hospital, the important thing we want to try to do after we've decided that they've had a stroke is why do they have a stroke? And so you go through different uh, various workups. We look at your heart. We check your blood. We um, check your cholesterol. We check uh, your uh, hemoglobin A1C. See how well your diabetes is. We're going to ask questions about your history. Do you smoke? Um, have you, do you have a family history of clotting disorders? Um, so we'll uh, go through all of that stuff uh, to try to figure out if we can identify a potential cause for the stroke. Uh, we get an MRI to look at your brain. Even the distribution and how the strokes look on the MRI can help clue us in on, on what might have happened. If you have strokes on both sides of your brain or in different territories, uh, then that's usually indicative of a uh, cardiac type cause. Typically, it can be other things, but that's the first thing we're going to look at. Uh, and we're going to get EKGs. You're going to be on telemetry monitoring. They may discharge your phone on a portable monitoring to, so that we can try to see if your heart goes into an abnormal uh, rhythm. So, like I said, atrial fibrillation is probably the most common cardioembolic reason uh, for stroke. But there's other things that can happen too. Uh, if you're, you can have heart failure. If your heart failure is significant enough, it's not pumping well and clots can form and that blood that's not, uh, that's pooling. You can have a problem with your heart valves. Uh, you can have infections where uh, you'll have bacteria actually growing in the heart valves, uh, endocarditis, which is endocarditis, uh, prosthetic valves. If you're, some people need to be on anticoagulation for those prosthetic valves. And if uh, the anticoagulation stops, you can form clots in those valves. Um, we have what we call a PFO. Um, this about 25% of the people, of all people, have a PFO. It's, it's just a small area that allows the right side of your heart to communicate with the left side of your heart. And so um, a clot from, potentially a clot that maybe is in your leg uh, can actually go up and then cross over from your right heart to your left heart and then go up to your brain. 
uh, or uh, the septums in your, in your heart can be aneurysmal or bulge out. If they bulge out, what happens is that blood that gets in that bulge, it pools, okay? So pooling is bad. We don't like the pooling of the heart. Um, so typically, uh, we treat those with um, anticoagulation, a lot of them. Uh, if it's endocarditis, we're, treat, we're, we're not doing anticoagulation, we're treating the uh, infection, infectious process. Sometimes it may just be uh, aspirin. Um, this is the atrial fibrillation. Now I'm going to get into the hemorrhagic strokes. These are the bleeding type of strokes. Um, and for the, for the bleeding type of strokes, we've got kind of two different types, uh, two different main types. We have what we call intracerebral hemorrhage. This is bleeding that happens inside, deep in the brain tissues itself. And you can see this here, you can see it's all inside the brain tissue. And so that's uh, more um, of the intracerebral hemorrhage, more, much more common than the other type of bleeding, which is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Definitely less common. Uh, there's bleeding in the, the subarachnoid space around the brain or on the outside of the brain. And typically, um, those are either from a traumatic event. Uh, like car accidents, things of that nature, or um, probably the most commonly is you have uh, what they what they call aneurysms, which are weakening of the, of the arteries, artery walls, and they bulge out. I think I've got a little picture here. It's kind of hard to see, but it's a little almost looks like a little balloon. And so the problem is those that that ballooning, the walls are very weak. And so if the blood pressure gets too high, um, it can start bleeding spontaneously. Um, so those are all very emergent situations. On the intracerebral hemorrhage, sometimes it can be from trauma, sometimes it can be from uncontrolled high blood pressure, which is probably the most common. Um, bleeding disorders, uh, tumors sometimes can bleed. Another interesting one is a process, and we typically see this in, in, in the elderly. So once people get into their late 70s and into their 80s, um, they have this uh, protein buildup on the, on the, on the tiny uh, capillaries and, and the very tiny arteries inside your brain, uh, which make them more likely to bleed. This is called amyloid angiopathy. It's a fancy word for saying that the blood vessels are weak uh, due to this amyloid buildup. Um, and they have typically what we see on MRIs is they've had all these tiny little bleeds over the years, uh, and then all of a sudden one of them just bled out really big. Um, typically, you don't know if you have that. That's something we have to identify. So when we when people come in with bleeding inside the head, the very most important thing that we want to do in the emergency room is to control that blood pressure. Vast majority of those uh, uh, of those bleeds are are due to uncontrolled blood pressure. So we get very nervous when we when someone comes in with with uh, stroke like deficits and their their the top number on their blood pressure is like. 2.30, that we'll get very concerned about that we're gonna find a bleed on the CT. So, uh, so that's a big one. Sometimes it can be, uh, uh, we can treat them with surgery. Um, every head bleed, uh, we consult the neurosurgeons, come in and take a look to see if there's any sort of surgical intervention that they can do. Um, well, in my experience, <laughs> that we may have this many head bleeds come in um, but neurosurgery is going to operate on about this many. So uh, it's, it's a limited patient population that they actually do surgery on, um, but, uh, but, but that is uh, available. Um, if they are on some sort of blood thinner, sometimes someone might be on like warfarin, and uh, for one reason or another, um, their 
uh, their blood level of the warfarin gets too high and that can cause them to bleed. And so we oftentimes will do what we can to reverse those, those processes by getting vitamin K and things of that nature. Um, also do, we also look at the blood vessels in their head. We get the, um, uh, what we call CTA, and it looks at all the blood vessels in their head um, to see if we can find any aneurysms or our, our artery or We would definitely quit uh, this, uh, and, and even from an ischemic stroke standpoint, um, you know, that's just such a huge risk factor um, for for brain health. Um, so, okay. So this is a CT of the brain, and I don't have a, a normal picture to show you, but what I can show you is you're going to see all this chalky, see all the chalky white areas all through here. All that is, is subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? So it's, it's outside the brain. Here, this, this almond-looking thing here is called the pons. And so you can see all that blood that's outside surrounding the, the brain stem there goes all the way around any, any of that uh, uh, the potential space there in the subarachnoid area that fills with blood um, and, and just bathes the brain with blood. And that outside of the brain is, is uh, blood is an irritant. Very, it makes the brain very irritable so they can have seizures. Um, it can cause blood vessels to spasm. Uh, blood vessels are great for transporting blood. Uh, in the vessel, but they do not, the blood vessels do not like blood outside of the vessel. It wants to get away from it, so it spasms. Um, typically, uh, the subarachnoid hemorrhage, it comes with the thunderclap headache. We try not to use the worst headache in your life because I've had lots of worst headaches in my life. Uh, and so we try to, it's usually thunderclap. It's very abrupt and it just hits you. Uh, like, like, the, like a close lightning strike, a thunder clap would hit you. Um, uh, definitely with the pain. Um, irritation with uh, moving, or pain with moving the neck uh, and the back as, as all the meninges can irritate. Um, light may bother you. Um, you can start getting increased uh, intracranial pressures. All bad, all bad. That's why these are very, um, very difficult patients. Sometimes they, they um, oftentimes their um, mortality is pretty high with these patients. They can go into comas. It takes a long time for them to, to recover. Whoops, I lost it. 
So um, this is just the aneurysm. There's different shapes and sizes, and and uh, neurosurgeons can um, they can either do just like a normal operation where they they put a clip, they put this clip on the base of that aneurysm that cuts it off from the rest of the circulation, or they can put these little tiny metal coils up in there. They just keep putting all these little coils inside the aneurysm. And when you get enough of the coils in there, the blood that is in there all clots off. And so then it separates uh, the aneurysm from the rest of the circulation as well. And, and you know, your, your risk of bleeding goes way down. So there are some treatments that they can do with that um, uh, to help prevent others from bursting. Um, all of our stroke patients get vascular imaging. And so if we see aneurysms, we usually have neurosurgery come and, and comment on them. Whether, and usually, most of the ones I see, um, if we if we find a, a, an aneurysm on accident, usually it is kind of want to watch those unless it's really big. Um, but usually just want to watch it. Um, so this is the subarachnoid hemorrhage management. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, one of the biggest, like I've been mentioning, the vasospasm or those blood vessels spasming. Um, that's a in the subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, that's just really uh, just a bad uh, complication that you can have with those. And uh, it's usually up to three weeks um, that you can start experiencing the basal spasm. And what happens is it acts just like a stroke because that blood vessel will spasm and close down and then cut off blood going to the rest of the brain and to have stroke like this. And actually have a full blown ischemic stroke uh, from, from that. Uh, um, so they give medications uh, to help prevent the basal spasm. And calcium channel blocker medications that relax those blood vessels so they don't climb down. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is some pictures of uh, cerebral arteriogram. This is what the interventional radiologists can go. And go into the groin and take a look uh, at the blood vessels. Um, so you can see that this scanner is in here. Uh, we talked about the clipping and the coiling. Those are the two most common uh, treatment options. For like I said, a lot of them will um, kind of, if they're smaller in size, they just kind of watch them. But if they're big enough, uh, they can put a clip around the base of the neck of the aneurysm, just like that. Or here's just a, a little picture of the coils, and they just feed those coils in there, and, they, and they're very pliable, and they just spindle up in there and, and, and coil all around inside the aneurysm, and then it'll, it'll just clot off and break off. And uh, the coils help, help that to clot off. It also helps strengthen the aneurysm so it doesn't burst. There's a pipeline embolization device, and I'm not totally as familiar with this one. Um, like we said at the very beginning, every stroke is different. Every stroke survivor is unique. Uh, as stroke survivors, uh, you all have your unique path that you're on, that you've been that you've been on, that you've traveled. Whether it was from the the when you first had your stroke, to your hospitalization, to your rehabilitation, and and then and then just you know living your life with these deficits, everybody has their own unique path. And I think that's why it's important that we have these get-togethers. Number one, so you don't feel like you're going on this this path by yourself. You have other people uh, that are that are on the journey with you together, uh, and then also obviously you know staying engaged and, and really working on those deficits to maximize um, your ability to uh, to do what you want to do in life. So. Any questions? This is 